Heavenly Father, thank you for the firm foundation that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ, and the, the historical fact of the resurrection that if you defeated death, Jesus, then, then there's nothing you cannot overcome and defeat. And so we gather this morning simply to say thank you. We gather to rejoice in you, to sing and to celebrate, and to give thanks to you for what you've done for us. Um, we've all brought in different baggage, struggles, hurts, anxieties, fears, wounds. And so I ask that you would, through your spirit, through your word, would you meet with us this morning? Father, for those of us who are holding on to anxiety and stress and worry, trying to do this life on our own, would you give us the grace today to cast those anxieties and worries on you? Father, for those overcome um, and overwhelmed with shame and guilt that sin brings, uh, would you remind us of, of the good news of the gospel, that Jesus paid for all of that? Father, for those here who don't know that you are good, that you're a loving Father, I pray that this morning you would soften hearts, open eyes. Would you help me to make the gospel, the good news, really clear and evident? Would you save souls this morning? Father, would you strengthen us, your sheep, that we might serve and love and let that abundant life of Jesus flow from us so that this world might see the hope, the light, the love, the goodness of your son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray you'd fill me with your spirit so that I might feed and serve and strengthen and shepherd your sheep really well. I pray they'd be fed and pointed to your son this morning that you, Father, would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Welcome to Hillside. Thanks, Lewis. Well done, brother. Uh, I've met a whole bunch of guests, visitors, first timers, and I just want to say we are absolutely delighted that you're here. Um, I have no idea how you ended up here this morning, but you're here, and I want to make the whole service really simple for you. At Hillside, we believe Jesus changes everything. That means he has changed everything, he is changing everything, and one day he will change everything. And he's done it through this thing that Christians call the gospel or the good news, that Jesus Christ died in your place for your sin, that he was buried and that he rose again. And when you understand the gospel, you'll understand that Jesus truly can and will change everything. Because him dying on the cross paid for your sin so that you don't have to carry your guilt and shame anymore. It's killing you. I don't know why you're still holding on to it. Jesus wants to take it. So in this sermon, I'm going to encourage you to, to go to Jesus, give your sin to Jesus. Because you see, when Jesus died, he was buried. He rose again, which means he's taken care of eternity. He's overcome death. So a lot of you have come in with a lot of worry and stress and fear and anxiety because you look out to the future. Well, Jesus has already secured the future. So today I want you to put your faith in Jesus and watch him begin to change you because he changes everything by changing us from the inside out. When, when you step over that line and put your faith in Jesus, he moves in and begins to do a makeover. He matures us and he'll begin to change you. It's a slow process called sanctification. But this, this isn't just theoretical or hypothetical. Um, I preach from, from a place where Jesus, I was the biggest doubter and he's, he's been changing me. You see, August is always my, one of my favorite months. It's my wife's birthday and my sobriety birthday. My name's Dave, I'm a new creature in Christ. I have new life in Christ. And this August, I'll celebrate 21 years clean and sober by the grace of God. So I, I share that with you and, and we applaud, not because I've done anything. We applaud what Jesus does in us. So I don't care what you've brought in with you this morning. Your sin really is great, but our Savior Jesus really is greater than your sin, and so you can bring it to him today. Uh, so we're super duper glad you're here. For those of you who are regulars, we've been seeing how Jesus changes everything through this thing called the church. Uh, he puts us, he calls us out of darkness. He puts us in this body called the church. We get together and celebrate. And unbelievers, non-believers come in and they look at you guys and they're like, what is this going on? They see the life of Christ, the joy of Christ in you and it begins to change everything around us. So we're in Ephesians chapter six today. Uh, let me read it for you. It's about our spiritual armor. So Ephesians chapter six, verse 10 down through verse 17. 
God says, Paul writes this, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish uh, all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So this is God's word for us this morning that we're gonna enjoy together. So as we, as we go through this, let me give you a big theological perspective. Because if you read through the entire Bible, and you should because it's one book that tells one story of one God who has one plan to send his one son to provide one way for us to escape death and have eternal life. And if you read through the whole story, it's an epic story, it's a perfect story. One of the big character attributes of God that you would see, and it's one of my favorites, and maybe just because I'm a dude, but one of the fav- my favorite character attributes of God is this. God, the one true God, the God of the Bible is a warrior. Yes. Okay, one person. <laughs> no, he makes the gladiator look like a Girl Scout. He is so scrappy. Your God is scrappy. You, you need to know that. If I walked you through Genesis, you would see there's times he takes everyone out because the only thoughts and intents of their heart were all, only evil continually. Totally scrappy move, boss move. Then you get to Exodus, he wipes out Pharaoh's army, boom, gone. Uh, you go through the Bible and God's a warrior. This is really good news because the small theological picture starts in Genesis 3 when sin enters into this story. It's really good that your God's a warrior because we have an enemy who's declared war on God and all of his creation on his people. Revelation chapter 12, verse seven and 17, Satan declared war and said, I'm gonna kill you. And I'm I'm gonna take out everything that God loves. You see, he doesn't play by the Geneva Convention rules. He's sadistic. So it's really good to have a a scrappy warrior uh, who is your commander. Now, the beauty of this book is that it shows us how scrappy God is. He loved us so much he sent the perfect warrior so that we might see the perfect warrior. His name is Jesus Christ, fully God, fully man. And Jesus came and declared war on death, Satan, hell, and the grave. And in the most boss epic move ever, most astounding move ever, and, and you, when you read through this book, you'll see it. Satan invaded God's kingdom in the garden and he took God's children captive. That's Genesis chapter three. God in the most epic move ever, my word's not his, it's like God looked at Satan and said, I'll be your, I'll be your huckleberry. Like, let's roll. <laughs> Satan invaded God's kingdom, so God sent his son to die, to invade Satan's kingdom. Satan took God's children captive. Jesus Christ came, invaded death, and set the captives free. Perfect inclusio. The story's epic. So your God's a warrior. Today you're gonna see, as Paul goes through, he's from prison, he's giving us a pep talk. It's Paul's prison pep talk for all God's people. He's saying, hey, the battle's on. Suit up, show up, uh, because this war is real. And so he's gonna walk through and say, number one, be strong. It's actually in the passive tense. He says, be strengthened. Uh, Number two, he's gonna jump in and say, I need you to suit up. So be strengthened, suit up. And then he's gonna say, I I need you to be aware of the schemes of the devil. He runs the same plays over and over. So be strengthened, suit up, Know know the enemy's plays, and then stand firm because God wins. And so he's gonna give us a four point pep talk that we get to enjoy together. So let's jump in, go ahead and pull up chapter six, verse 10. 
Let, let me show you this. It just shows up in the text. Typically, and in your Bible, there's probably a separation point here, and it says the armor of God. It separates verse 9 from verse 10. This word finally uh, doesn't mean uh, I'm just put, Paul, Paul doesn't mean I'm just putting extra stuff in. I would have translated, um, and in addition to what I just told you. So he just got done saying, every single one of you has a play to run. Doesn't matter if you're married, single, kid, worker, employer, employee, every single one of us has a three yard play to run to get the first down. Um, So husbands, love your wives, lay down your life, serve your wife, you care for her, she is your treasure, there's your three yard play, you run it really well, every day, over and over. Wives, respect your husbands, love your husbands, submit to their mission as they follow Jesus, there's your three yard play. Now, admittedly, nobody in our culture likes their three yard play, amen? It's like, well, I don't like mine, he's not doing his, he doesn't do his, I don't do mine, forget it. And then kids are like, they're not doing their three yard play, I'm not doing my three yard play. And the whole thing gets messed up and we never get the first down. That's what's going on in American Christianity. Everybody's watching every other person not run their play and say, I'm not running my play. Paul says, no, run your play. Kids, obey your parents, honor your parents, employees work really hard as unto the Lord. So Paul's given us the pep talk and says, in addition to this, there's something you need to know. I want you to, I would have translated this, be ye strengthened. I like the King James. I memorized it in King James. It's in the passive tense. He says, I want you to be strengthened in the Lord and in the strength of his might or power, strength. So he uses it multiple times. He uses this, this word power, strength, in both the ve- verb and noun form. Doesn't matter to you, matters to me. I enjoy that. Paul's playing with language here. But he says, I would put it, well, and I did in my Bible, S- stay spiritually hydrated. All of you are taking something in. Have you ever been dehydrated? I figure in Texas, most of you have. I moved down here, didn't know about dehydration. And it, it's really bad. Like all of a sudden I couldn't breathe. I couldn't make it upstairs. My kidneys were hurting. I called the doc, Doc Nolan. I was like, dude, I think I've got kidney cancer. I'm dying. He's like, what? <laughs> no, that's how my mind works. I, I'm like, worst case scenario. He's like, what's your symptoms? I can't breathe. My kidneys hurt. And the doc was like, hey, I'm going to ask you a question. When's the last time you peed? And I was like, that's a super duper weird question, but it fits for docs. They ask weird questions. And I was like, hey, if you need to know that to figure out if I have kidney cancer, I haven't peed in days. And he was like, hey, I need you to go get Gatorade, drink a lot and drink until you cannot stop peeing and until you pee clear. And I was like, is that how you treat kidney cancer? (laughs) He's like, no, Dave, you don't don't have kidney cancer. You're dehydrated. Uh, You need to drink more. Spiritually speaking, many of you are spiritually dehydrated. See, all of us are weak and we're taking something in and what you take in, I learned this in computer programming class, Gigo, garbage in, garbage out. Like what you put in will determine what comes out and you happen to live in a culture and society that idolizes politics and so most of us wake up and we take in news every morning. And we wonder why we're ticked off, why we're angry, why we're anxious, fearful, agitated, why we're blowing up on 281, flipping people off and trying to, then we get to work and we scratch off the Jesus changes everything sticker because we feel guilty, amen? I've seen it. (laughs) What's wrong? What's wrong is what you're taking in. You're spiritually dehydrated because that's what the world does and you're not being strengthened because you're living in the news, the 24-hour news cycle that literally puts little shots of adrenaline, anxiety, and fear into your heart. You're spiritually dehydrated. You don't need the news. You actually need the good news. That's what he's saying. You want to you know what the good news is? You're never going to hear the good news on Breitbart, Fox, NBC, ABC, CBS, any of this. The good news is this. Your God is super scrappy and he's never, ever lost in the past. And he's not losing right now presently and he won't lose in the future. He wins all of the time and one day... Jesus Christ physically, literally, personally is going to come back. The trumpet of God is going to sound. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he reigns forever and ever. Dave, what is it going to be like? 
you're going to see the clouds opened up right like a scroll and there's going to be a cat on a white horse. His eyes are going to be a flame of fire and you're going to say, oh my goodness, that's Jesus. I'm going to say, I told you. He wins, wins, wins. And that's the good news that will hydrate your soul. So be strong, be strengthened. You're here, you're exhausted, you're frustrated, you're tired, you're not being strengthened in the Lord. You're spiritually dehydrated and your spiritual kidneys are, are painful and you need to be strengthened in the Lord. That's Paul's pep talk n- number one. Just write down, stay, am I, am I being spiritually hydrated? Number two, watch verse 11 because he's gonna go from... Um, Stay spiritually hydrated to make sure you, you, you bring your gear with you. Make sure you bring your gear. Watch what he says, verse 11. Put, this isn't a suggestion, this is a present active imperative. Put on the full armor of God so that you might, you might be able to stand firm. Put on the full armor of God is the command and it's perpetual You need to keep doing it. See, if you're gonna run your three-yard play, you got to be suited up. Now, let me unpack this. Apparently, at some point, if you're a Christian, you signed up to follow Jesus. You said, I'm in. Paul says, since you signed up, I need you to suit up. Christianity isn't a spectator sport. In America, we've kind of turned Christianity into a spectator sport. That's what Sunday mornings have become. We'll show up because we signed up, but we don't really suit up for battle. That's what the pastor does or what the staff does. And so let me tell you this. If if you're not actually in the competition, you're going to be complaining. If you're not actually competing and realizing You need to suit up just as much as I need to suit up. You signed up, show up, and suit up because you're in the game. Let me come at this from another angle. In America, what's happened is we've, really since early on, we began to see this world as a playground. I don't know exactly when it's happened. I've studied culture, studied society, sought to figure it out. It has something to do with this idea of the American dream in retirement where we think, I'm gonna work 30 years, I'm gonna grind it out, I'll get a nest egg, and then I just get to relax and have fun and play because this world's a playground. That's what we think, retirement, After when I retire, I'll have fun. The truth is, you retire and you don't have fun. You retire and you start going to the doctor nonstop, amen, old people? Like it's non, it's nonstop, like on Golden Pond, nothing. Uh, Like it's, it's, but we view this world as a playground. You need to know that because our God is good, we do get to experience joy and delight, but this world is not a playground. This world is a battleground. Through and through, the Bible says you were born into a world where Satan is fighting against God and wants you dead. And many of us are practicing spiritual procrastination and we will not suit up. I'm not gonna do it because then I might have to get in the game. Let me tell you, there are no bench-riding Christians the battle will come to you. And if you're waiting until the bullets are flying to suit up, when the bullets are flying, it's not a good time to find your skibbies and, and, and shoes, amen? Like at that point, it's too late and you're gonna call me and say, Dave, what do I do? I'm gonna say, man, it's really hard to suit up when the battle's on. But every day is there, there is an opportunity to simply suit up because the truth is there's skirmishes in your life every day, aren't there? So you're waiting for the huge battle, but every single day there's skirmishes. Are you winning the skirmishes or losing the skirmishes? Are you aware that there's skirmishes every day? I was aware every single day this week because they're doing some work on 281 right down here. Do you see that? Putting the power lines up. And so they, they squeeze 281 down into one lane. Now, I'm a honorary Texan and so I act like an honorary Texan and when they squeeze you down into one lane, I get in the appropriate lane. Do you know what happens when you get in the appropriate lane? All the Californians start cruising by on the, and you know they're Californians. 
because a Texan wouldn't do that. I'm an honorary Texan. I squeeze over, and all of a sudden, I see all the Californians <laughs> cruising by, and there's a skirmish inside. I'm looking at these losers, and I'm like, "Are you kidding me?" <laughs> and so inside, all of a sudden, there's this battle over: Am I going to be loving? Am I going to be patient? Or am I going to cuss these guys and start being like, Cutter, 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 Californians, you guys are horrible. And they don't know what I'm doing. They just know that I'm, I'm doing something weird. They're probably saying, man, that Oregonian, he's weird. The, see, there's a skirmish that goes on every single day. The question is, are you winning those skirmishes? Because if you're losing those skirmishes, you're... Your soul, your character is being marked a little bit each day. You're not suiting up in order to show up. And I can guarantee you when the battle comes, because it will come to you, you won't be ready for it. So number one, stay hydrated. Number two, bring your gear with you. You're going to need to suit up. The battle's going to come to you. Number three, uh, he says, know the schemes of the devil. Uh, in sports lingo, we would say, make sure you watch film on the opposition, when, if any of you played football or really any other sport, you watch, you watch tape or watch films of the opposing team and the defenses they run, the plays they run. So Paul says, number one, stay hydrated. Number two, bring your gear. Number three, make sure you've studied the enemy's, uh, his plays. Watch what he says here. I'm going to go stay on 11 for a minute. Put on the full armor of God. Why? Well, so that you'll be able to stand firm against the Say it again. Be, be, well, mm, be able to stand firm against the... Okay, I probably would have translated... It's, it's methods, methodologies. The enemy has uh, a playbook that he runs. He has a method of how he seeks to attack us. He's got blueprints, schemata. Uh, that's the Greek word. He knows the plays he's, he's going to run. But you need to know this about the enemy. Although he's incredibly crafty, he's not creative at all. You see, that's a character attribute of God, that creativity. Satan lost that. He's incredibly crafty, but he's going to run the same plays. I'm going to show you um, the overall strategy. He, he talks about it here. The overall strategy of how he's going to come against you. And then the three tactics he's going to use, mix match, he's going to use them perpetually. You ready? Here's the overall strategy. So that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the... So he calls him the devil here. This is an interesting word, diabolos. Diabolos, if you take it in the Greek, dia in the Greek means through, balos means to throw down. You can translate it slanderer. I like to think of it as the enemy's scheme is the old tactic of divide and conquer. Divide and conquer because it is tried and true and the enemy is really good at it. He's like, he's like an evil MacGyver. He'll use everything. MacGyver uses everything to escape and he, he can use everything for a purpose. Satan's like an evil MacGyver. He will use everything to divide us, anything. It doesn't matter what it is. And he knows it. He says, hey, male and female are different. And I think we've, I think we've agreed on that. Males and females created uniquely in, in the image of God, but different. Good. Because you live in a culture that's like, no, they're the same. They're not. Some things are self-evident. Dudes and gals are different. Amen? Amen. Thank you. And the enemy says, oh, we can use their differences against them. See, dudes and gals think different, and so we'll divide them. We'll divide husband against wife. We'll call it feminism and chauvinism. We'll divide them and conquer them. He'll, he'll use which state you're from. Did you just see it? Some of us are Texans, born Texan. Where am I born Texan? We're here. A lot of you. Now I'm afraid. Because that was actually a trick question on who's packing. I'm, I'm kidding. Sorry. But then the Californians move in because the hill country's beautiful and all of a sudden you'll see stickers don't don't california my texas we can divide them over that we'll divide them over uh skin color we so it's not only sexism uh but we'll use racism or ageism do you know old people don't like young people i heard you got those whippersnappers i mean they bring coffee in here what whippersnapper does that 
Well, that's not helpful, old people, calling them whippersnappers. And then the young people, those fuddy-duddies, you know, they're all, they, they're yelling at me, get off my yard. And when, they, oh, when I was your age, it was all snowy all the time and I had to walk to school and we didn't have shoes. And so you got the whippersnappers and fuddy-duddies. The enemy will use division to split you up. He'll do it with your children. He'll do it with your marriage. He'll do it with your family. He'll do it with your community. He'll do it with the country through politics. He doesn't care how he divides. He just wants to divide because he's wicked like that. Now that's his overall strategy, just to divide. And you see, you see the storm clouds brewing, don't you? Even in our nation. Uh, entire algorithms are built to divide you in marriage, to divide you from yourself. Now watch what comes next because now he's gonna show us some tactics that the enemy uses. Go verse 12, verse 12 our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual for- forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, our, our struggle is not with humanity. I don't care which political party. This is why I can tell you, I don't care which political party you're from. Both political parties, all political parties need Jesus. So because my battle isn't against flesh and blood, I don't care what your gender, what your background, what the race, color of your skin, what state you're you're from. My battle's not against flesh and blood. We fight against a wicked spiritual enemy that's a lot more powerful than us. And when he begins to use his tactics, here's three that he'll use underneath this division strategy. First tactic, temptation. Matthew chapter four, verse three. His name is tempter. So he'll tempt you. Anybody ever been tempted with sin? Okay, about half of us. That's good. That's good. I'm tempted about every eight seconds. It's the worst when I'm preaching. I've got multiple streams of thought and conversations that go through my head. It's perpetual. In temptation, here's what he does. You can see it when he tempts Jesus. In temptation, he minimizes sin. Remember back in Genesis, sin crouches at the door. It gets small and it just purrs. Nothing to see here. In temptation, the enemy will tell you, it's not a big deal. It's just a click on the computer. It's just a, it's just, Dave, it's just a little drink. It's not a big deal. After he gets you on minimizing sin, temptation, do you know what he does next? Revelation 12, 10, it's called accusation. Because once you give in and he's minimized sin and accusation, he maximizes it. You loser! That's the worst sin ever! How could you do that? You don't know God. You don't love God. You're not a child of God. You can't go to him now. He hates you. He's against you. You're awful. Here, he minimizes and purrs. Here, he maximizes and roars. It doesn't matter whether it's temptation or accusation. It's his strategy to keep you divided from God, division, and divided from one another because he isolates you, separates you, so he can devour you. So that's what he uses, temptation or accusation. I I wonder which one you're fighting against today because after he does that, then it's just deception. He's called the liar, the father of lies. And once he's gone division, temptation, accusation, now it's deception, military deception. He'll just figure out how to get you off the trail. You see, something happened in America when Hollywood began to make horror movies. We began to think after the movie Exorcist, hey, the devil's only at work if there's somebody crawling on the ceiling and their head is spinning around and green stuff is flowing out of their mouth. Then that's, that's the devil at work. That's Hollywood. If you read Genesis to Revelation, The enemy, he doesn't leave fang marks in the flesh, he leaves falsehoods in the frontal lobe because he knows that deception, if he deceives you, you'll destroy your own life. In fact, one of the enemy's greatest deceptive lies, I don't have time for this, I guess, I'll take 37, 45, a minute on this. I'll take a minute. One of his greatest lies, you're living at a time where secular humanism is the religion of the day. I don't know if you know it or not, secular humanism says there is no God, therefore we are God. 
And when we are God, whoever has the greatest power is the greatest God. Therefore, government's God because there is no God. We're God and we get to rule ourselves. That's humanism. Humanism puts self at the center. It's about what I think, feel, and want. Now, humanism, the religion of humanism, is undergirded by scientific naturalism. Naturalism began to be pushed in our schools. Naturalism says all that there is is all that there is. If you can't measure it, test tube it, and empirically prove it, it doesn't exist. Therefore, there is no devil. There's no devil. So there's nothing to fight. Therefore, all of our problems have natural answers and there's natural solutions. You don't believe me? I was watching serial killers all weekend on this show, which might be my problem. But I was watching it and it was astounding to me because when the serial killer would be brought into court, the defense would put out all of these natural reasons why this person is evil. It's naturalism on display because there is no evil. People are basically good. Therefore, we have to determine why this person is serially killing people and eating people. And they would be like, well, a lot of bad stuff happened to him. See... This naturalism began to take off once this idea of good and evil began to die. You saw it in the 60s, didn't you? Uh, John Lennon wrote this song, Imagine. Imagine there's no heaven, no hell, no nations, no possessions. We can all be one and it would be delightful because there is no evil. You saw it grow a little bit more and it worked its way into literature. You ever read through a book? It's called Silence of the Lambs. Uh, It worked its way in there. Chapter three, page 21, Agent Starling is interviewing Hannibal Lecter. And she looks at him and says, Hannibal, what, Dr. Lecter, what happened to you? And he looked at her and said, nothing happened to me, Agent Starling. I happened. You've reduced everybody to moral behaviorism. And in moral behaviorism, nothing is anyone's fault. Agent Starling, I happened and I am evil. And it shook her. You see... Even in literature, we began to do away with this idea of good and evil. Um, You saw it when George W. Bush stood up and said, we've been attacked by evil. And our nation freaked out and said, you can't call people evil. That's hurtful. That's narrow-minded. You see, a society, and this is a quote from Andrew Del Bonco, a brilliant, uh, he's not a Christian, but he's a brilliant author out of Columbia University. He wrote the book, The Death of Satan. He said that society that has no vocabulary to describe evil will be overtaken by evil because if you can't define the evil, you can't defend against it or defeat it. That's where America is. We no longer can define evil evil. See, this is why Paul said, I want you to study tape. I want you to know 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. Don't be unaware of the schemes, the plays that the, the devil runs. Because if you're unaware of the plays, you'll be unaware how to defend. You'll be unaware of what's going on around you. The enemy doesn't leave fang marks in the flesh. He leaves falsehoods in the frontal lobe to divide you. Your wife isn't for you. Your husband doesn't love you. God isn't good. God isn't in control. Those little lies will divide you from God, divide you from one another, and our nation will go down the tube. Now, three minutes left, and we still have six points. So stick with me, because you're going to experience a little bit of turbulence on this part of the flight. We'll go 13. Stick with, I'm going to go 13 and 14. Now, what do we do about it? Paul says, I want you to suit up and stand firm. If you're not suited up, you're not going to stand firm. So... Watch what he does here. He's going to walk you through the full armor of God. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Verse 14, stand firm, therefore. How, Dave? How do I stand firm if the enemy's using division, temptation, accusation, and deception? Well, you're going to stand firm having girded your loins with truth. It's a funny phrase, is it not? Can we just chuckle together? Put Put on your skibbies of truth. I mean, that we interpret it, do you have in your Bible the belt of truth? This is more like underwear, under armor. The, um, this girded your loins with truth. It was a leather sheath that would go clear over you like under armor and every other piece of armor would stick onto it. What does this mean to gird your loins with truth? It means you actually know who your God is. 
that you actually know that God is love and that God is good and does good and that God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son. When you know who God is, then you'll know also who you are in Christ. Some of you have not girded your loins with truth and you don't know who you are. And when the enemy begins to tell you, you're a piece of trash, you're worthless, you're pointless, there is nothing good about your life, you take it on. And I have to sit down and say, listen, yo, you got, you got to gird your loins with truth. He's calling it, the enemy's calling you worthless. You're, you're worthy in Christ. You're adopted, you're adored, you're accepted, you have access to God. You're beloved, you're born of God, you're a child of God, you're a citizen of heaven. And I have to begin walking you through so that you'll gird your loins with truth. Because if you don't know who God is and you don't know who you are, you'll never stand firm. You'll actually stand down. And that's why I believe so many of us just play spectator sport Christianity. We don't believe what God has said about us. But when you've put on, you've girded your loins with truth, you can actually have fun and join the fight. You can have fun because God wins and you can join the fight because God wins. So there's, it is a win, 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 win. Because God wins, you get to win, you get to join the fight, you get to have fun because God's already wrapped it up. That's the truth. Gird your loins with it, it'll change your day. Next he goes here, um, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, super important. Again, our enemy does not play by Geneva Convention laws or rules. He always goes for the kill shot. Breastplate of righteousness covers up your vital organs. Because here's the truth. When you run your three-yard play, at some point you will fumble, you will fail, and you will fall. Anybody ever, you, you've gotten up in the morning and you said, I want to serve my wife and love my wife. I want to honor and respect my wife. I want to parent well. And the first thing you do is fumble the ball and fail. Anybody been there? Yeah, pretty much every day, right? And the enemy will say, the enemy will say, because he's a deceiver, liar, he's a loser, and he will absolutely seek to abuse you. God doesn't love you. Give up. Shut up. Stand down. Why do you keep acting like you're a Christian, Dave? You're worthless. You fail perpetually. You know this. Every day, it's big gulps of failure. Why do you keep trying? And if you don't have the breastplate of righteousness on where you understand Romans chapter 8, verse 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ, if you're not able to tell the enemy, listen, you're a loser and you don't understand truth. God has forgiven me, he is sanctifying me, and I'm secure for all eternity. If you don't know this, you don't have the breastplate of righteousness and you will stand down and you will shut up. And the people who need to see repentance and forgiveness lived through you won't see it. So that's the breastplate of righteousness. Go verse 15. Uh, and having shod your feet with the gospel preparation, with, man, that's a weird, it's, it's even stranger in the Greek. Having shot, put on your Nikes. Put on, I mean, put on your shoes and your shoes are the gospel of peace. Here's why I think he puts it in this construction grammatically. Um, so many of us in our culture, we, we haven't shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. It, you know what I'm talking about if you're a parent and you've bought your child, at the appropriate age, the Legos, when your child will no longer eat and swallow the Legos, you get your six-year-old the, the Legos, and they never clean the Legos up. So downstairs in your house, it's like a landmine of Legos. And I'll never forget the first time I experienced that. You come down without your shoes on in the morning to get your coffee, and you step on a Lego. <laughs> it's like it, it, it will expose to you how tender your feet are. In our culture, Hillside, I love you, I'm for you. In our culture, our culture of secular humanism has sought to get us to take off our, our shoes, the gospel preparation of peace. We walk incredibly tender-footed. We, we, you call it cancel culture. If you say the wrong thing at the wrong time in the wrong way, we'll cancel you, be afraid of us. And then once they've pushed that on us, now they say, you should be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He's a bigot, he's a racist, he's, he's absolutely oppressive to weaker class. You should be ashamed of the gospel. You see, the enemy doesn't want you to shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of 
peace. I'll tell you this. There are things in America that I am ashamed of. I'm ashamed of how we treat women. I'm ashamed of how we treat the unborn. I'm ashamed of our political discourse. I am ashamed by a lot that goes on in America. I truly am. But I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God into salvation. And I'll tell you this, you, I guarantee you, you say anything anywhere at any time to anyone, you'll be hated for something. It's just America right now. Choose to be hated for something that matters. I believe the Bible's God's word. I believe it's eternal. I believe it's good. I believe it's absolutely true. Hate me for that. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and I'm not ashamed of him. He's the only one who had the power to change my life. You will be hated for something. Don't let it be for the gospel. Put on your shoes and be a peacemaker wherever you go. Love people really well. Watch what comes next, verse 16. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith. Again, the shield of faith is necessary. This is having your mind protected and guarded by the truth of God because the enemy will, he'll fire uh, fiery darts, fiery arrows at you. And they're, they typically have to do with you He does incredible opposition research on all of us. He knows you. He truly does. He knows exactly where you've fallen, your faults, flaws, and failures. And the fiery darts, he'll begin to shoot them at you. You honestly think you're a Christian. Look at what you've done. You honestly think, do you honestly believe God loves you? Look at who you are. Look at your story. You know who you were, and he'll shoot these fiery darts. The shield of faith is beautiful. It just comes from Ephesians chapter 2, 8, 9, and 10. It's when I get to say, you know what? Satan, you're right. Man, I'm, man I am absolutely messed up. Praise God that I've been saved by grace through faith and that not of myself. It's a gift of God, not of works lest anyone should boast. See, Satan, you're trying to make it about me and it's just not about me. It's not about my good works, how good I am, what I've accomplished. It's actually all about Jesus Christ. So go ahead and take your lame argument to him and let him deal with it because he's gonna crush your head on the sidewalk. He's gonna do the boot stomp because that's what Genesis chapter three said. He's literally gonna smash your head. So why don't you talk to him about it because it's not true of me. That's the shield of faith, absolutely necessary. Watch 17 and we'll land the plane here, go into communion. Take the helmet of salvation. Oh, this is beautiful as well. So many of us struggle with our salvation because we don't understand he has saved us from, from the penalty of sin. He is saving us from the power of sin. Your whole life is gonna be growth in Christ. None of us have arrived yet. But in that, the enemy is gonna say, do you really think that you're saved? Do you really think you know him? Do you think he knows you? It, you see, there's doubt in this life. Faith isn't faith without doubt. And in that doubt, he plants seeds. You're not saved. You don't know him. The helmet of salvation. I love Romans. You memorize through Romans. Chapter eight, you get to 38, 39. Paul says, I'm convinced of this. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate me from the love of God. I'm gonna run my three yard play and it's okay if I fumble. At least, I'm, at least I fumble while daring something greatly. You see, if you don't understand that, you don't have the helmet of salvation, then he says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Friends, you need to know This is the most brilliant book that's ever been written on the face of the earth, ever has been written, ever will be written. Again, it is the top selling book year after year after year. This year, another $500 million in America will be spent to buy this book. Why? Because this book is utterly perfect. Psalm 119, 105. His word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Take the sword of the spirit because the sword of the spirit, the word of God is gonna explain to you where you came from, where you're going, why you're here, what the problem is, what the solution is and how Jesus changes everything. And when you know where, where you've come from, where you're going, what the problem is, what the solution is, you can simply rest and walk by faith. Now, this is a lot, so let me land the plane with this. It's been a lot. I've given you probably over 4,200 words in 35 minutes. 
And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Dave, I can't even remember my password on my banking app. Do you honestly think I'm going to remember uh, all the plays the enemy runs and all the armor of God? This is what I love about the scriptures. It's not about you, and it's not about what you can remember. God has made it so simple. He's taking He's taken all of these words, 782,815 words. He squeezed them down and said, I just need you to remember one word. I've squeezed it all down into one word for you. You can remember one thing. Hopefully you can remember just one thing, one word, one name, because this name is the armor of God. The armor isn't something or some pieces. It's a person. His name is Jesus. He is the truth. He is your righteousness. He is your peace. He is uh, your absolute, the object of your faith. He is the gospel. And he is absolutely the living word. And Jesus Christ won. He's already won the battle. It's not up to you to win the battle. He won when he said it's finished. When he said, this is my body, which is for you. This is my blood, which is for you. And when he said, this is my body, which is for you, he said, as often as you do it, do so in remembrance of, remember Jesus. As you remember Jesus and focus on your savior, I can guarantee you, you'll stand firm in the fight. As Jim comes up and we celebrate the Lord's Supper, would you pray with me and ask the Lord to give us grace to remember the one necessary one. His name is Jesus. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that although we were unworthy and ill-deserving of your grace, you sent your son to show us what love is and what love does. Jesus, thank you for winning the battle. Thank you for purchasing us. And now as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Father, I pray your heart is pleased. I pray that our praise might arise to you like a a pleasant aroma of incense as we say thank you. Jesus, thank you for purchasing us. I pray that you would soften our hearts now and give us time as we remember you to rejoice in this work you've done. It's in Jesus' name I pray, Amen. amen.